Now, I want to I want to talk to you about in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Before I begin this lesson here, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, <clears throat> you will turn to category number eight, and you can write these things down on the back of a page there under that category. Make sure all cell phones are turned off. <clears throat> the reason this lesson in the mouth of two or three witnesses is so vitally important is because you'll hear a lot of preaching in the so-called Christian world. And they'll talk about the grace of God saving you, the love of God saves you, the mercy of God saves you. The love of God does not save you. The mercy of God does not save you. The grace of God does not save you. They are contributing factors only. The thing that saves you is obedience to the doctrine. That is what saves you. And once you begin to become obedient to the doctrine, grace will come running. The love of God will come running. The mercy of God will come running to you and just scoop you up in their arms and hold you. But not until you become obedient to the doctrine. It is the doctrine that saves you. The answer, when they cried out at Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter gave the answer. He didn't say, you're all covered by the grace of God. He didn't say, you're all covered by the love of God or the mercy of God. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2.38 and verse 39. Everyone say, Amen. There is a basic foundation in this particular lesson, and it begins with a verse of Scripture found in the book of Deuteronomy 19 and 15. So if you turn in the book of Deuteronomy to chapter 19, And verse 15, here was a law established by God given to Moses. And it's one of the most incredible laws because it afforded such great protection to individuals. And here it is in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Here was the command from God to Moses and the Hebrew children after they had left Egypt and the bondage there. He said, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two or at the most, or the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witness, witnesses shall the matter be established. Look how just this is. Look how safe and merciful this is. In other words, if some person came against you and accused you of something, it would not hold. It could not hold. You could not be judged by the accusation of only one individual. You had to have two or three witnesses that came against you that said exactly the same thing before you could be condemned and judged by the laws of God. It was total security. It was a blessed, tremendous law for the Hebrew children to live under. And here's what's interesting about it. The entire judicial law of the Old Testament rested upon in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every matter was established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. If you look in 2 Corinthians 13.1, it is quoted there, 2 Corinthians 13.1. Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, he reminded them of this. Paul, in his writings in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, said, This is the third time I am coming to you. Under, underscore this in your Bible here. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So he told the church in Corinth, 
I'm coming to you. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And then in Matthew 18, 16, Jesus taught it. Matthew 18, 16. Matthew 18, 16 says, Jesus is speaking here. <clears throat> he says here, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. In other words, the whole judicial procedure of the law and in living for God among his people was in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Jesus taught it. It was established as a law in Deuteronomy 19.15. Paul quoted it in 2 Corinthians 13.1. Jesus in Matthew 18.16 taught it. <clears throat> so there's an interesting something that happens in the Gospels. If you look in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, John chapter 8, And verse 13, <clears throat> before I start this though, let me mention something to you. You may or may not know this. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was written to the Jews to persuade them of this glory and legitimacy of the Messiah. That's why in the book of Matthew you find all these genealogies because that's what the Jews were interested in. Where'd you come from? Can you prove who your father was? Can you prove? So Matthew dealt with the genealogies of Jesus all the way back through to David. Amazing, all the way back through to Adam because Matthew was written with the intent to convert the Jews. Mark, Mark was written to the Romans and the Romans were interested in power. So, in the book of Mark, there's just one act of power after another because it was written with the intent to convert the Romans. But then Luke was written to the Greeks and the Greeks were interested in a perfect mind, in a perfect body, healing. And so you'll find all kinds of examples of healing one after another in the book of Luke, because it was written with that intent to convert the Greeks to the gospel. But then John was written to whosoever will. For that reason, you'll find things in Matthew you will not find in Luke. You'll find things in Luke you will not find in John. You'll find things in John you will not find in Mark. Because the reason, the intent, the goal of their writing of each of these apostles was different reaching a different group of people. So now here in the Gospel of John chapter 8 and verse 13, they are accusing Jesus. They're trying to find fault with him. So here's the setting, John 8 and 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself, underscore the word record there in verse 13. Thy record is not true, underscore, thy record is not true. In other words, they had checked the genealogies. They could not find his father listed anywhere in the genealogies because his father was not earthly. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost. His, his genealogy, his father's name was not in the genealogical records. So they brought this accusation against him. They said, your record is not true. Jesus answered in verse 14 and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Here he quotes it in verse 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Look at this. I am one that bear witness of myself, 
and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Two witnesses declaring that he was who he was. And this is what is so interesting about this uh, to me. Because God is legally bound to his word, all that he does in heaven and in earth is established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's interesting to note that even when he could not find a man to agree with him, he swore by himself to establish a matter. Jesus swore by himself. He said, I bear record of myself. My father bears record of me in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Powerful. Powerful. How many of you have ever been trying to tell someone about Jesus and they don't believe it, that the Holy Ghost will rise up in you and the anointing will come on you and he'll bear record that what you're saying is true? Lift your hands and thank the Lord for that. You've got the greatest witness in all of the universe alive inside of you. His name is Jesus. I feel like shouting, but we'd lose the class. So just lift your hands and let your voice out for a moment. Jesus, I thank you for the moving of the Holy Ghost in every student here, the power and presence of Almighty God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, if you understand what I've just taught here, <clears throat> you'll understand why the trial of Jesus took so long. They arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, but the trial went on all night long. Because in order to condemn him, the priest knew in the temple they had to find two or three witnesses that would say exactly the same thing about him, make the same accusatory remarks, the same proof statements against him before they could ever condemn him. And the witnesses were hired. They were lewd men of the baser sort from the streets. And they were liars. And they couldn't get their stories together. The witnesses did not say the same thing. So the trial went on and on and on and on. Finally, Jesus, in Matthew 26, he condemned himself. He said, in fact, it might be interesting to turn there. If you look in Matthew chapter 26 that the witnesses couldn't get it together. But between verses 58 and 65, you'll find it. In verse 64, Jesus condemned himself. They used his own testimony against him. Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the close saying, Blasphemy, what further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So that is what they condemned him with, words out of his own mouth. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word biblically has got to be established. It took them all night to condemn him. And finally, in questioning him, he uttered the words that they would use against him. This is, as I said, a judicial law of the Old Testament. So how does that apply to what you and I need to help us in living for God? It's simply this. There is no way you can make a doctrine out of anything that's in the Bible unless you have two or three verses of Scripture that say exactly the same thing. The whole judicial procedure of the Old Testament was in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So, based on that principle, that truth, can we, as apostolic Christians, can we make a doctrine out of repentance? Can we stand and authoritatively, biblically preach, you must repent to be saved? Yes, we can, because there are not just two or three verses that talk about repenting. There are many verses that talk about repenting. So we can authoritatively stand and preach and insist, you must repent of your sins to find God. Everyone say amen. 
Can we make a doctrine out of baptism in Jesus' name? Can we insist that you must be baptized by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? Can we make a doctrine out of that? Yes, we can, because there are four places in the book of Acts where it says specifically they baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. So any one of us now can stand up with authority, anointing, and we can say you must be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins to be saved. You must be born of water. Can we make a doctrine out of preaching and teaching that you must receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues when you're born again of the Spirit? Can we? Can we? We can. Why? Because there are more than two or three verses that example that they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues when they were converted to Jesus Christ. So we can authoritatively preach repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues. Can we authoritatively stand and preach, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Can we say, can we authoritatively, biblically say, there is only one God? There are not two gods, there are not three gods, there's not a half a dozen gods, there's only one God. Can we make a doctrine out of that and preach it with authority and power? Yes, we can, because there are many verses that talk about only one God. Can we authoritatively stand and preach that you need to come out of the world and you need to be holy, you need to practice and live holy? Can we preach holiness of dress and modesty? Can we preach that you have to be holy inside and outside? Can you preach that? Yes, we can, because there's more than two or three verses that admonish it, that insist upon it. Now, can you, can you make a doctrine out of Matthew 28, 19, which says, Go ye into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Can you make a doctrinal formula out of that verse? And can you use that verse as a formula for water baptism? No, you can't, because it only appears once in the entire Bible. But there are four places where it talks about being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So even if I were not a believer, if I were just a gambler, I would gamble, I would be baptized in Jesus' name, because it's four to one in favor of baptism in Jesus' name. you got a better chance of making it by being baptized in Jesus' name. And Father's not a name. Son is not a name. Holy Ghost is not a name. His name is... Shout it for a moment. Jesus. Lift your hands and shout it. Jesus. You can feel the air tremble when you say that because there's power in the name of Jesus. There is no power like the name of Jesus. And only the name of Jesus in water will rid you of a lifetime of sin. If you feel like it, just clap your hands for a moment and let your voice out to the Lord. Jesus. I worship you because you are God. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 22.5 talks about this. It's only one verse of Scripture. It says here, it's a law of God in the Old Testament. God gave it to Moses. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So, those that oppose holiness say, look, you can't make a doctrine now. That only appears once in the entire Bible. That statement is not a doctrine. It's a statement of fact by the Creator Himself, and there is nothing you can do against it. It's a statement of fact. <clears throat> so, case closed. Mm. This truth will make you free. It doesn't say set you free. It says make you free. In other words, the truth will make you free whether you want it or not. 
That's why David said, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. God will make you free. He will make you free. But then the choice is yours. What will you do with this freedom? What will you do with the truth that has come to you? What will you do with the word of God that has come into your life and into your heart? The final choice and the final decision is with you and you alone. How many of you love the truth? You love the truth. Worship the Lord for it for just a moment. Would you do that? That's it. Just let your voice out. Jesus, I praise you tonight for the presence of God that is in this place. Blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. <coughs> Connected with this lesson, in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verses 62 and 63, an interesting thing here. The Hebrew children had come back to Israel after the Babylonian captivity. And when they were trying to reestablish the faith in Judaism and who would be in the priesthood, in order to be in the priesthood, you had to be able to prove you were from the tribe of Levi. And uh, so they were checking the registers, these various people. If you look at 62, it says, These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. And the... Uh, Tishatha, that's a governor, said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. <clears throat> in other words, under the law of Moses in the Old Testament, the tabernacle plan, the priesthood, the temple, the priest wore a breastplate. And on that breastplate, there were 12 precious stones and it was called, we pronounce it, Urim and Thummim, but in Hebrew it's called Urim Vetumen. Urim means light. Tumen is truth. So the high priest was required to wear light and truth on his breast, on his heart. Preachers to this day, men of God, are supposed to wear truth and light upon their breast upon their heart and that's what they represent truth and light so when they came to inquire of the Urim and Thummim or the Urim Vatuman when they required or when they actually required an answer if you go to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem and I've been there a number of times where they are planning building the, to make the, build the next temple, and they are making all of the furniture and the, the robes and all of that that I could spend a lot of time talking about, and they've got them. It's just, it's magnificent to go there and see it. In fact, it's a highlight of going to Israel, is to go to the Temple Institute and see the crown for the high priest and the robes and the mitre. It's just astounding. And they've even found the, the particular little animal in the sea that gave them the rich purple dye that they used in the royal robes. And they have, they've made the white linen robes now. They've got them, you can see them there for the ordinary priest when they build this next temple. But when you go there and they lecture you, it's just incredible. The lecture is incredible. They will tell you that when they came to inquire of the Urim and Thummim, when they came to inquire, that the answer, think about this, the answer came through those stones. The rabbi there that lectured us said, behind the stones on that breastplate, a light would come on and Hebrew letters would be formed in light and they could read the actual answer that God gave them. Thou shalt not go up to fight. Thou shalt go. I will give you the victory. 
the breastplate actually became illumined and the letters glowed and that's how they received light in the Old Testament. And so they, here, they were doing that. They were inquiring of the Urim and Thummim to see who was a priest and who was not. Thank God for light. Jesus was light and truth. He was the breastplate, light of the world, the truth that would deliver you from all things. Thank God for the truth. Thank God for the truth that has made us free. Back to in the mouth of two or three witnesses before we conclude this particular lesson. <clears throat> You will understand that in the book of Judges 6, 33 through 40, Gideon fleeced the Lord. I'm sure that most of you know about that. He took a fleece and put it out and uh, waited for the dew and no dew and whatever. He fleeced the Lord to know whether to do something or not. But fleecing the Lord appears only once in the entire Bible. So you can't make a doctrine out of that. It's not a doctrine. I've known a lot of people that have fleeced the Lord asking him for an answer, and God has honored it. But you cannot make a doctrine out of it because it only appears once in the entire Bible. Now, <clears throat> lift your hands, your voice again, and pray for revelation, understanding. Lord Jesus, I pray for revelation, understanding once again upon every student here, every man, every woman, every young person, every adult. God, the truth, this truth, your word, will become indelibly ingrained in the tissues and the fibers of our hearts forever, I pray, in Jesus' name. So let's go, to, you can still write on the back of one of those pages there uh, in the, your doctrine area. <clears throat> in the book of Acts, there are those that oppose us. There are those that say you don't have to speak with tongues. It was only for the apostles. Only 12 people spoke with tongues on the day of Pentecost. And they've got all these arguments why we should not speak with tongues and why it was given. Well, what are you going to do with that? So let's just have a little religious analysis here for the next few moments and let's study some of these things. I have developed what I call proof units. Proof units to prove Baptism, prove oneness, prove Holy Ghost, prove holiness, prove it all, proof units. And I pastored in upstate New York when I first got out of Bible college. I passed an area that was predominantly Roman Catholic. And there was a lot of Trinitarian Pentecostal churches in the area, and they fought us. So how do you, how do you answer them and not be um, swayed or not be moved or changed in your thinking? Nothing moves me. I've got it, and I know I've got it. And you've got it, and you should know that you've got it. Nothing that comes upon you will topple you. In other words, truth has made us free. Free of what? Free of every other ideology, every other doctrine, every other school of thought. I mean, no Mormon would ever convert me. No Jehovah's Witness would ever convert me. No Catholic would ever convert me. There's no way. No Muslim would ever convert me. No Hindu would ever convert me. They wouldn't. No Buddhist would ever convert me. Why? Because when I got this truth, it made me free of everything else that is out there. I have got it. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Another that is not coming. This is that. You can come from anything to this, but you cannot go from this to anything else. There is nothing else to go to. This is the end of the line. So get in it and live it. In fact, I wasn't raised in this, as you know, and I used to pray. I didn't want to come into this. I was happy in the church I was in. I didn't want to come into this at all. But you made such powerful statements, and you had the Bible to back it, and I couldn't fight it. I absolutely couldn't fight it. And I used to feel sorry for you people. I did. I used to pray that God would help you and bless you, whatever, because I felt sorry for you. I went to a big, beautiful church, and the apostolic church that I was attending for the first or second time, which is a basement in a parsonage, and I was very happy where I was. But <clears throat> I can't lie to myself. Some people can, but I can't. 
The more I talked to you about this, the more sense it made. And I used to pray, before I ever met you people, before I ever heard about apostolic Christianity, Acts 2.38, before I ever heard anything about it, I used to pray, God, I want the truth. I want all of it. I want everything you've got for me. I used to pray that all the time in the Evangelical Free Church, Billy Graham Crusades and all of those things. So one day when I was fighting you after I'd been to visit one of your services and you'd present all this truth to me, I had to make some decisions and I, w I was fighting it and I was praying and crying and God, I was just saying, God, and all of a sudden, God just stopped me and he'll do that. And he said, this is what you prayed for, so get in it. So I saluted, clicked my heels, and said, yes, sir. And I started coming here. And I got baptized, I got the Holy Ghost, and here I am. This is it. This really is it. This is the greatest thing that has ever happened to any of us. There is nothing that can compare with this. Nothing. Nothing that can compare. There's nothing out there. There's nothing out there that can compare with this. How many of you agree with that statement? Amen. In fact, I really believe that this church, this group of people, will be used more mightily than you can possibly believe in the end time revival that is coming before the coming of the Lord. The next great revival will come through the 1040 window. I've preached that here before. You know it's true. And God has caused you to come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There's no telling what many of you will be doing before Jesus actually comes in the clouds of glory. How many of you are excited about that? Are you excited? You people are real, shall I just say it? You people are just real fanatics when you get to going. And if I'm going to be a fanatic, I'd rather be a, have it be about Jesus than anything else in the entire world. He's worth being a fanatic over, don't you think? The best thing, say the best thing that ever happened to me. Amen. So there are those that would like to <clears throat> minimize all of this that we preach and teach and uh, talk us into something else or tell us it's not all that important. Well... Number one, they say that only the twelve apostles spoke with tongues. <clears throat> I can prove to you from Acts chapter 2 that more than twelve people spoke with tongues. Because if you go through there and just count here, because uh, they ask in verse 8, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? It starts out in verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, Pamphylia, it goes all the way through. There are 17 different languages being spoken there. So you can prove there's more than 12. You can count 17 different languages they're speaking in the upper room. So you can prove that more than 12 spoke with tongues. You can count 17 different languages there. So that argument's knocked out. Well, then they say, well, it was just a miracle of speech. What do they mean by miracle of speech? There are whole Christian denominations that teach that they spoke with tongues so they could preach the gospel to every nation in the world at that time. Well, how do you disprove that? It's very simple. At the time of the Holy Ghost descent in 33 AD, Greek was the universal language of the day. So you could have gone anywhere and preached in Greek and they would have understood you. And if you were Jewish, all Jews spoke Hebrew. So if the Jews had only preached to the Jews worldwide, they could have preached in Hebrew anywhere and they would have been understood. Case closed. It was not a miracle of speech. It was the birth of the Spirit. The birth of the Spirit becoming alive. When God takes up residence inside your heart and soul, a baby in the natural cries when it is born and it's alive. When the Holy Ghost becomes alive in you, when God makes his ostentatious entrance into your life, that Spirit will cry. That's where speaking with tongues comes in. The Holy Ghost inside of you will speak and we know that you are born again of the Spirit of God. Have you ever noticed how we gather around people who are praying to receive the Holy Ghost and we just sort of labor with them just like people labor with a mother in a delivery room 
But the moment that baby begins to cry, the delivery is over. And those of us in altar services, the moment they begin to speak with tongues, and I'm a great one to do this, I get down with my ear close to your mouth so I can hear the first words that come out. I want to hear when you begin to speak with tongues. And I'll just say, they've got it. You've seen me do that. They've got it. So then the, 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 the time of rejoicing, it's time to rejoice and clap and don't groan and moan and intercede and labor. It's over birth of the Spirit. The Spirit will speak when He is born alive inside of you. So, then they'll throw at you, well, it's a miracle of hearing. <laughs> it's amazing what people do. If people spend as much time looking for the truth as they do trying to disprove it, they'd all find it. Don't you think? But they'll work at just trying to disprove you. So they say it's a miracle of hearing. In other words, what they're saying is, all these foreign Jews that gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover, they came from all over the then known world to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. They were there from all these different countries. <clears throat> so, the Jews outside the upper room that had come, they were all foreign Jews, most of them, from all over the world, as I just said. The, what they're saying about the miracle of hearing is the, the, the disciples, 120 in the upper room, who were Galileans, basically, they were all speaking the Gale Galilean dialect, but the people hearing it, they heard it in their own language. It's a miracle of hearing. In other words, God, supposedly, it was miraculously, it was interpreted as they spoke in the Galilean dialect, it was interpreted in the hearer's ears in their own language. Well, how... You disprove that. It's not difficult at all. Because the Bible says in verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. God would not give such a gift to mockers and scoffers. It was not a miracle of hearing. They were speaking with languages unknown to them. But those languages were the languages of these foreign Jews that the Galileans did not know because they never traveled to those countries. Case closed. Do you like it? I just love it. In fact, the more you study, here's what happens to you, okay? The more you study like this, you reach a place where you've got all the answers. You can hardly wait for them to ask the question so you can give them the answer. It makes you very confident in your faith. It makes you very secure in what you have in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that lesson is concluded. We're doing